All right. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our session. Um, so, the first speaker is going to be uh, Martin Plenio from uh, Ulm University. He's going to talk us uh, talk about uh, Ford's robust interference with uh, massive particles. Please go ahead, Martin. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, and uh, thanks everybody for uh, inviting me to this meeting. Uh, to present some of our work and um, to participate in the discussions, which I think is very nice. So um, uh, the title has been read out already, so let's let's get started uh, right away. And um, I start really way back in 1957, just briefly, I mean, many of you will know it, of course, uh, in some discussion session in the Chapel Hill Conference, Feynman um, discussed a particular experiment, which was uh, essentially a, a Stern Gerlach, where he then imagined that the, that the uh, beam of particles uh, would come in, they would be separated. And um, in this separation would then be amplified to larger objects like this ball here. Um, okay, this should move. Yeah. And uh, which then would go to uh, interact with a, another test body, perhaps. And initially, we would have a coherent superposition interacting with this test body. And then sort of this test body would also move. So while Feynman certainly didn't express it in that way, that's, of course, an entangled state um, that we have here. Um, and that's a, that sort of start arose in the discussion of whether there was a necessity for uh, quantizing the gravitational field. And so this is, of course, the kind of experiment that one would like to, like to do. Um, but of course, in 1957, this was really, really hard to imagine to do. I mean, this is, uh, was way, way beyond any technological capabilities that they may possibly have there. And that's certainly highlighted by this fact that in 1952, just a few years before, Schrodinger gave this famous quote that you really don't, in, you know, don't experiment with just single electrons or atoms or so, um, because it's, I mean, just as much as you don't raise dinosaurs. And, um, and uh, at those, in those days, these were really truly, truly Gedanken experiments and were so far removed from any experimental capability um, that it was really hard for people to imagine that they could do something like, like that at all. Um, and I mean, here, of course, the challenge is even bigger because it's not merely one electron or one atom or a small molecule, but these experiments would have to do with rather large masses. So there's really no way uh, that in 1957, they could possibly consider doing something like that. But of course, things have changed um, with the over the last uh, 70 years, almost or 60, 65 years, uh, with the especially with the rise of quantum technologies, which really moved particles at all length and mass scales, either into the quantum regime, or at least much closer to it. As you can see from this, um, graph here that I took uh, from, uh, from the paper by Whittle et al. Um, there are kilogram masses that are cool to, you know, near the ground uh, state. Um, there are single ions have been cooled to the ground state, of course, but also atoms and larger particles like uh, the recent experiments from Markus Aspelmeyer. All these are moving into the regime where you have phonon occupation, which is at least in the single digits or so, and um, or maybe ten phonons or so, but I mean really close to the to the quantum regime, and that of course starts to change the picture from this being a fanciful Gedanken experiment to something that one is still extremely hard, uh, but at least may be considered as a realistic prospect uh, to be to be done. And this has, of course, stimulated all sorts of work. And um, I mean, this is just a, a short, I mean, just some articles um, that uh, touched on these topics in one form uh, or the other. Um, and that by the topic, I mean the, the, the interface between gravity and quantum mechanics in, uh, in various ways. And there's, there's more and more work on that. But of course, we still have to accept that this is not trivial to do. 
And um, so there are basically sort of uh, first words now I want to say about, you know, experimental aspects. So, I mean, the rest of the talk will really be about how could we possibly improve on experiments such that they might become feasible in the realistic, reasonable future. And first, I would like to say a word or two about um, the way that this is done. Okay, this is very bad. Um, so, um, so one way um, one could imagine this is uh, is indeed like in the Star and Galach that I mentioned before, and that is also uh, very much pursued by Sugato and his friends. And uh, that is um, of this type here. So we split the wave function somehow into two packages, one going left and one going right. And so basically one makes Schrodinger cat states here. And what one gets in phase space is an object of this form. So we, here's the position, here's one part of the superposition, here displaces the other part of the position, superposition. And because we are in a coherent superposition, we have actually interference terms at, uh, near the origin. And what happens now is, although, uh, so that the, these interference pattern have a periodicity, which is inversely proportional to the displacement of these two dots here. So the, to the separation in space of these two masses. So the farther these masses are split, the higher the frequency of these patterns here and the narrower the features become. And so that means now if you apply some displacement orthogonal to that uh, periodicity here, you will very rapidly shift it by half a period and then the state actually becomes orthogonal on the original state because you get a negative contribution in the overlap from here and a positive here and they cancel. And the very same thing you can actually achieve if you take masses and you do something, you don't create a non-Gaussian state, but you create simply a Gaussian state, which is a squeezed state. And a squeezed state in phase space would look like this. And it will become very narrow in one component, but of course extended in the other uh, component. And again, if you apply some force or so, uh, some acceleration orthogonal to the, to the narrowly squeezed direction, you will very effect, efficient, efficiently transfer the state to an orthogonal state by a very small displacement. So in that sense, actually, while the states are very different, the principle behind these two approaches is essentially uh, the same. We create narrow structures in phase space that react very, uh, very uh, sensitively to very small displacements. And the nice thing about um, these squeeze states here is that they are indeed uh, Gaussian states. And so one way of creating those actually, these squeeze states is by periodically modulating the trapping potential, just opening and closing it um, periodically with uh, half the period of the system. And as a result, in each such step, you will actually increase the squeezing uh, and very rapidly uh, achieve a state of this form. So that's something that we did in this work down here. And at the same time also, uh, Marcus Aspermeyer and Oriol Romero Isard, they had the same kind of principle that, uh, that they used uh, to create these squeeze states to achieve higher force sensitivity. So that's certainly a way to make the experiment uh, more sensitive. Um, if you have at your disposal only uh, a trapped particle and control over the time, a time dependent control over the potential. So that's kind of nice, but reality is of course, that even if we do this, we, be, we are sensitive to the desired signal to some very small force. Um, but at the same time, we are also more sensitive to all sorts of noise from the environment. And um, here's a little plot from a, uh, from a master's thesis that, that we conducted where we indeed studied um, a set, set situation like this. And we looked at uh, the sensitivity to a random force. It doesn't matter exactly what it is. Anything that creates a random acceleration uh, could represent this. And one sees that then one really 
if one has these two particles, they start to interact and um, you try to build up entanglement. This entanglement is very effect efficiently uh, suppressed by very, very small random um, accelerations, which are roughly of the order of 10 to the minus 17, 10 to the minus 16 meter per second squared, which is not surprising because that's roughly the force that we are trying to detect. So it's not, not super surprising here. But of course, uh, this, this uh, has some consequences because this kind of small accelerations um, can come from all sorts of sources. And it's actually fun to really think about this and analyze the materials and the experiment very carefully um, to see what sources uh, of force could there actually be. So one is gravity, for example. If I, the presence or absence of a mass of one kilo in a one, one kilometer distance leads to an acceleration of about 10 to the minus 17 to the minus 16 meters per second. So that means even tiniest fluctuations in the atmosphere around your experiment will actually already lead to random accelerations. And so we have to think what we do about this. Also, I mean, gravity is one thing, but electric forces are, are just as bad if you have a if you have um, an, a single electron uh, away from, from a 10 centimeters distance from this body, from micro, one micron body, which has a static dipole moment created by one um, electric charge, elementary electric charge, you will also get this kind of a, a acceleration. Magnetic dipole forces, all these sort of things, temperature collisions. I mean, there are many, many error sources. Um, that we have that will interfere with this experiment in a negative way and make it harder to observe it. And therefore, um, there are two ways in which one can deal with that. One is, of course, we simply go and clean up the experiment, make everything as perfect as possible. But there are limitations to that. Um, and I come, I mean, I've worked a lot in recent years uh, in, in ultra precise sensing using color centers and diamond. And there, of course, another strategy is that we actually use control of the experiment, um, um, control fields, for example, to actually suppress the noise while keeping sensitivity to the signal alive. And this is really a strategy that we should follow. We should really design experiments in a way that they suppress some of these noise sources as, good, as well as possible. Yeah? And so that to, to make the life of experimentalists easier, of course. And um, so, I mean, one, one brief thing that, that we, we started out with was really to actually try and um, average out slow noise that comes from some fluctuations that are relatively slow, but still at a finite rate in, in an experiment. And um, so how we would do that is kind of indicated here. So here we would have a mass and a potential we let's say it is indeed a diamond nanoparticle and it contains a spin and we use this spin in the magnetic field gradient to split the wave packet by a pi pulse and and then after a while we reunite it again and i'm sure that uh, ryan will i saw the title of his talk he will talk more about these kind of uh, things um, but the problem of course is that when you split these particles and you have a random force then you will acquire a random phase and this can destroy the interference here. So a better way of doing that is actually to symmetrize the paths. And that would go roughly like this. So you will split the wave packet and you at some point you flip the spin, you use the, 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 the magnetic field gradient together with these spins to actually now make a symmetrized path that flips back and forth and you arrange the um, the path in such a way that the particle really spends half the time on the left and half the time on the right. And if you do that, then actually at least uh, gradients, um, uh, uh, force, let's say forces, gradients of the potential will be averaged out uh, exactly if you time the path very carefully. Now, you have to be fast enough because if the field changes during one of these oscillations, then the cancellation is not perfect. But uh, now you can start to think how you design your experiment that is consistent with playing such a protocol to symmetrize the path sufficiently fast to, to actually um, cancel out some of these uh, noise sources. But then, of course, you always run the risk of also uh, canceling, in fact, the force that you want to see. And in that case here, that would be the gravitational force between two particles here on the left and to the right. And if you symmetrize the path, 
you might initially think that indeed you would also average out the gravitational force from this particle. But because this is done in a, firstly, in a um, orchestrated way, so the same path is done on both sides. And secondly, because the particles are relatively close together, and therefore they are not only interacting via directly by force, but also via the gradients of the force. And those are not canceled out immediately by this kind of path. And so you can actually play these kind of games and um, make sure that forces from close by particles are less effectively canceled than forces that are originating from distant noise sources. And so that's an idea that I would like to pursue a little bit further here. So here, we looked at uh, rotational degrees of freedom, which may also be of interest. In principle, you could also place uh, the body into the superposition of two orientations and then try and see how you pick up a phase between these two different uh, configurations and, and also create perhaps entanglement between the two. And of course, the problem is yet again, you have a distance source of, let's say, a distance noise source, some gravitational force, electric force, whatever it is. And these different orientations will, of course, suffer, at, uh, experience a different potential and therefore accumulate a different phase. And if this distant noise source is random in time, also, then this will be a random force and it decoheres your system quite uh, effectively. And uh, so what could you do about it? Well, one thing is you could take this body and you shape it like a sphere. Then it would be completely invariant under rotations and therefore also would not suffer any decoherence. But then you also cannot really place it into superposition of different orientations of that uh, sphere. That would be extraordinarily difficult because it would really couple to nothing at all, no forces. And so therefore we have thought, we looked at this again and we thought, okay, if you have this potential from or this, um, this distant so noise source here, it will create a potential here um, at the point of our test mass. And we can expand the potential around the center of uh, mass of this test mass, and we will make a multipole expansion. And um, we will have different orders here. And uh, the nth order is simply an nth order polynomial in the uh, position of all the, of all the masses in the test mass, right? So that's, that's kind of the, the contributions that we have to now eliminate. We would like to do this ideally to all orders, but maybe we can just cancel out the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth order in a systematic way. And uh, indeed, you can do this without turning the body into a spherical object. And there you can use some nice feature from mathematics and it is called a spherical T design. And what this is basically is, is an, for an polynomial, sorry, you have a, let's say a function here on the surface of the sphere and it's a polynomial of order T. You can find an arrangement of discrete points such that when you compute the function at these discrete points, and you average over those discrete points, you will get actually the exact average of this function over the entire sphere. So this can be proven that this exists. And therefore these points for a potential that is a polynomial of order T will behave as if they are spherical. And so therefore they become insensitive to this kind of, to the noise from that kind of potential. And so that means we can actually by choosing the right sort of number of points here, either two points that would be a linear arrangement, some tetrahedon here, or you go in a systematic way to a larger number of points, you can actually eliminate potentials up to the nth order in the dipolar expansion. And therefore what is left over is the, is the next higher order. And so therefore you have an error now that scales as the diameter of your test mass divided by the distance of the test mass to the noise source. And of course, this is a number smaller than one. And so if you raise this to the power of n, this very quickly goes down to zero. At the same time, the interaction between two test masses will also be reduced, but with a smaller factor because now it's the radius of the test mass divided by the distance between the test masses. And that raised to the power of n. And so therefore, in the end, the signal to noise ratio actually improves and in principle goes to infinity. So that's kind of a nice way of shaping bodies to make them resistant to noise from the environment.
And now I would like to play this game a little bit further again. So let's say we have played all these games already and we make an interference experiment very much motivated by some proposal that uh, Oriol uh, Romero Isart made a few years ago of having a particle propagating in a potential, then it uh, makes a measurement to make sure that there are two sources, that there are two parts of the wave function, they continue to propagate. And at some distance, they will give an interference pattern. And when this system is actually subject to distant noise, then actually uh, the interference pattern will be shifted around. So there's a random force again. So the interference pattern shifts back and forth. And importantly, it is not enough that we keep the, the, the interference just in one experiment. We have to make sure that we get the same interference pattern in many repetitions of the experiment because we cannot sample the interference pattern in just one experiment. We have to repeat it many times. And so therefore we have to have, to have long-term stability. And this will actually typically lead to a rapid destruction of the interference pattern. But what you can actually do here, four minutes. Yep, yep. Four minutes. what you can do here is you can actually improve this experiment by doubling it up. So you can make two experiments of the same type, although the masses can be different, the precise parameters of the interferometer can be different as long as we know what they are. And then we can actually achieve a situation where we do not measure the individual interference pattern, but we actually measure the difference between what we find, the position of the particle that we find here and the position of the particle that we find here. And that is more robust to actually noise from distant sources. Now, this is a fairly simple observation. The question is, does this also work when the apparatus, the two setups are not identical, when the masses are not identical and so on? Can you actually then also find observables that are robust to noise, but nevertheless, um, uh, give you a, a valid interference pattern. And indeed, so we went through the analysis. I don't go through details here, but this is what you can achieve indeed. And here you would have, let's say, the, the noiseless interference pattern from one experiment. Here you would have the noiseless interference pattern, the effective interference pattern from two experiments. You lose a little bit of contrast the fact about a factor of two. So you sacrifice something. And if the masses are very different, then you lose a little bit more, but you can still see that they have an interference pattern. And now the difference is really in the response to the noise. Up here, very small amount of noise, very small amount of forces will kill the interference pattern. While in this case here, it remains completely robust. And this we can extend to really different masses, all these sort of things, but also we can have a systematic way of creating setups that are insensitive to the nth order gradient contribution from the perturbation and therefore making it very robust to, to let's say, fluctuations from gravitational forces due to the atmosphere, for example. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's stuff that, uh, that we can do here. And so in the last two minutes, I want to just briefly mention something that when you have done these things, it's fine you will, might still have a problem with noise. And one another way is to actually accelerate your experiment. And that is what we thought about for quite a while. And for a long time, we didn't make it, didn't manage to make it to work. We had thought of taking two masses and harmonic oscillator, put a big mass in between, therefore benefiting from the fact that there's now a very much stronger force between the small mass and the big mass. And therefore we had hoped for some mediated force between these two parts between the two test masses here, mediated by the large mass, that would lead to an enhancement of the effective force between the two particles. Unfortunately, it never really worked because we, we could not find the right parameter regime. And for, uh, then we started to actually think, okay, why don't we change the situation a little bit and we place these two test masses actually into a double well potential. They're still sort of trapped in a potential, but in a double well potential so that they mimic a little bit more uh, um, uh, a qubit. And um, we do this and we worked out the result. And again, it didn't help. But then we, we took in another additional step. Namely, we realized that if we want to probe something about let's say a gravitational force here, there's no need for us to make this also a gravitational force. We could actually replace it by a much stronger force. So for example, we could say, 
One is the gravita gravitational force. The other one is Casimir force. And now things are coming together because now we can put, do an analysis of the system. It is actually exactly solvable. And we find the exact dynamics, which is composed of two parts. One is a part that, in, that entangles the test masses with a big mass in the center. And one contribution that is only leading to an interaction between the test masses. And so this is actually very similar to the zeros and Wormer gate in, in ion traps. And the nice thing is there are special moments in time, periodically spaced, where this interaction here actually is exactly the identity. So it's no interaction at all. And we become, the test masses become disentangled from the heavy mass, but the interaction term between the two is still left over. And it's a product of the two for, uh, coupling strengths, GA and GB, divided by the oscillation frequency. And if we choose this force here, larger than the oscillation frequency, which we can if we, have, if we have a double well potential, then we actually achieve a gain in interaction strength. So the in effective interaction between the two particles is enhanced by the presence of this heavy mass in the center. And you can go through the analysis and you can indeed see that entanglement grows more quickly. And you can also really analyze very carefully what is the enhancement that you can get. And you see that indeed you get an improvement that is a function of the ratio of the mass, the heavy mass uh, divided by the test masses. And so that's kind of nice that because now here also I should stress, because the, test the heavy mass in the center does not really entangle itself, at least we can be disentangled at certain moments in time, we do not even need to cool it to the ground state. It can be in a thermal state at a high temperature. It will still act as a mediator of the force between the test masses. And that can be quite helpful. The test masses themselves have to be cooled still. And so these are the kind of tricks that we are working on, trying to sort of find methods to make the system less sensitive to noise while retaining its sensitivity to the desired signal. And we hope that together with experimental ingenuities um, and really very high powered uh, uh, work in, in building wonderful experiments, we might be able to actually make a this final thought experiment, let's say a reality before its hundredth birthday. And with that, I would like to close. This is the people in the group and the, the ones in dark contributed to this work very much. And in particular, I would like to highlight Julian Peranales, who is the postdoc that uh, is on this work. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for, for a lovely talk. Uh, so we have uh, about three minutes for questions. I see Anupam's hand. That's the only hand I see currently. So thanks, Martin. It's wonderful mm -hmm. talk. Uh, very nice. Uh, so uh, there's a huge confusion and misconception, I guess, um, scientifically. But that maybe we can clarify. I think there's a huge lack of understanding of what is quantum aspects of gravity here in mm -hmm. your setup. But maybe we can discuss it a bit more in details. Uh, but uh, historically, I think your comment um, should be you should one should give credit to I, I guess Niels Bohr because it was Niels Bohr who actually uh, thought um, okay. for the electron and the photon that why the photon has to be quantum and it goes back uh, uh, when Feynman was rather a baby at the time he was not even an mm -hmm. undergrad student actually it's a very nice dialogue and I will send it to all of oh, you oh that would be lovely yes, yeah, yes. because mm -hmm. he was asking precisely the same question why photon is classical or quantum and how can you make it, uh, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. And then he uh, asked this question for the gravity also. But it turned out that with one single interferometer, um, he could prove that just with one single interferometer, he could prove that photon ought to be quantum, but the same could not have been done for gravity. So for gravity, you need to bring in two interferometers and that is, I think, the crucial part. This, the more- right more uh, scientific part, I, I was a bit more confused because you see that if, if you bring in a very massive source, mm -hmm. it will actually deface your system rather than entangle your system. So I was- well, that's, that's the lovely thing about it because 
indeed you would not, and normally it does. I mean, if you, if I go back to this picture here, so I had to be a bit quick in the end. Here, there's no entanglement between the two test masses because they are also entangled with the heavy mass. But now the trick is that there are special moments in time where the, the heavy mass becomes disentangled from the test masses. And then you see a large amount of entanglement. And that's exactly, uh, that's, that's comes from, the, you can see this from the exact solution of this. It's not an approximation or anything like that. So this Hamiltonian has an exact solution and it shows this behavior. And in fact, this is also, as I mentioned in the talk, is the basis for the servants and murmur gate in, in trapped ion physics, where one actually makes an interaction between two ions via their vibrational mode, ensuring that actually the vibrational mode at certain moments in time when you end the gate is not entangled with the two spins and nevertheless the two spins have suffered a quantum gate. And uh, so this is, this is really crucial here. At specific moments only, we will be able to see the entanglement between the test masses. At the other moments, we would have to cool also the central mass to the ground state and measure all three particles to see three particle entanglement. That's really the crucial difference. It becomes uh, the the entire enterprise becomes very complicated in this game. Mm, it's not so complicated because the the timing requirements are not so stringent here. In fact, okay. of course, if you want to have a ten kilo mass in between, uh, then you may have to be timing the thing quite well. But if you make the central mass a hundred or a thousand times larger than the test masses, then you actually will have to will not have to you might end up with maybe milliseconds or so of timing accuracy that you require yeah so it depends also on the oscillation frequencies of course of your of your test masses but um, it's not extreme it becomes extreme when the ratio of the two masses becomes extreme okay guys so, a bit over the time <clears throat> so Matthew, if you have one very quick question yeah, I mean, I can ask now or, or in the discussion session. I guess maybe. in the yeah. discussion because... Let's do it in the discussion yeah. session, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I also yeah. know uh, Andrew okay. couldn't ask. Sure. I stop my screen then, okay. Yeah. Yep. Thank Should you. So fine, no? uh, yeah. our next speaker is uh, Ryan Marshman from University College of London, uh, who is going to tell us about the design and uh, use of Stengelach interferometer for gravitational experiments. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk and everything. Uh, so yeah, I'll be going over uh, the recent work I've been doing over the past few years, which has been looking at the sort of the QGEM experiment as it was. And I've been looking at sort of, uh, there we go, uh, three sort of different prongs of, of ways uh, to, to do this or three different aspects of it. So uh, the first of what I'll be going over will be uh, looking at the QGEM experiment in the original form, sort of in fairly general terms of what, what it should look like, what are the key aspects of it, um, and then looking at various different ways we might be able to sort of rejig it so that it's slightly easier to implement, try to lower the, the barrier of entry, as it were, before we could witness a, a gravitational entanglement. Um, the second uh, component of the work that I've been doing has been looking at uh, Stern-Galak interferometers in particular, uh, and looking at how we might sort of de design them so that they're uh, taking into account various different uh, problems that will likely arise uh, as we're pushing, pushing to using larger and larger masses. Um, the third part of the talk, uh, which is part of the research I've been doing was been looking at sort of other applications for such devices. And I'm, I'm not sure if I'll have enough time to get that, but uh, I guess I'll see how we go. Um, so to begin with just a, a, hopefully a very brief overview of, of the QGEM experiment in sort of broad terms. And I'll try and be quick given it's going over a lot of what we've heard previously, but I think it's still sort of relevant to touch on. So the key thing is that by the QGEM experiment, I'm referring to the quantum gravity mediated entanglement of masses experiment, which is the proposal to witness quantum gravity in the lab, obviously. Um, and the key thing is that this really requires uh, massive spatial superpositions and, and very, very high precision uh, quantum metrology of you know, gravitational sensing type thing. Um, and I like to view it as, a, in some ways, a, an extension of the original cow experiment. I think it's a good place to, to start viewing what's going on here. So the cow experiment is, you know, the one done 
originally by uh, Kalela Overhauser and Berner. And what they wanted to do was uh, just look at a, a quantum system and looking at it uh, being its effect, or the effect of gravity on such a system. Uh, in their case, they just had a, a single neutron interferometer where they could uh, uh, basically uh, alter the heights of the two arms of the neutron interferometer against a gravitational background, in their case sourced by the Earth, uh, and then just look at sort of the interference pattern that results. Um, and the, the key takeaway was that they were able to show that you know, we can act a, a gravitational background field on a, on a quantum system while perfectly maintaining the coherence of such a system. And importantly, that the, um, the, the way you can sort of treat this sort of system is entirely like a, a standard potential uh, evolving the phases of the arms slightly different. And indeed, they, they were able to show the interference that you'd expect from that such a system. Um, so in some ways, the QGEM experiment can be seen as an extension of that with when, when you ask, well, what happens if we uh, source the, the, the background gravitational potential rather than by just the Earth? What happens if we were to use a mass in a superposition of states? <clears throat> um, so then the, the proposal was to take uh, two interferometers uh, that would obviously need to be much larger masses than uh, neutrons if we want to source a, a sizable gravitational potential. Um, and what happens if we just sort of, you know, let them interact? Um, obviously, as we know, we can, can write down the sort of phase evolution we can expect in that situation. And this is just straight away using the logic that was uh, evidenced by the cow experiment to write down that the, the joint states will evolve uh, like this. And the key result is that the, the masses do indeed become entangled. And so in that respect, it also goes beyond the original cow experiment, not just in the sort of source of the, the gravitational potential, uh, but also in that rather than just looking at a, an interference result, we're looking at correlations in the interference. Um, and so it really is that entanglement that lets, lets the final conclusion that uh, gravity would then have to be quantum if, if we witness uh, uh, the entanglement. Um, and sort of the, the key uh, part of the proof relies in uh, the properties of local operations and classical communications. Um, and as this has kind of been touched on previously throughout this workshop, I won't go into too much, but other than to say that there's a few assumptions that this sort of experiment still relies on. Um, they are that the, the two systems are truly at a distance. You don't have the two masses talking directly with one another. Uh, that's easy enough to arrange. Um, that there's no action at a distance. So that's that the, the gravitationally mediating channel between the two masses is indeed, uh, yeah, not acting as action at a distance. This is something else that's also been discussed and obviously uh, it's borderline whether it's worth even calling it an assumption, but moving on. Um, the, the other thing is we really need to make sure that the, the masses are indeed interacting with one another through gravity and that it is indeed the gravitational channel that, that is providing the either classical or quantum channel, which is enabling the, or mediating the entanglement to form. Um, also, uh, this is something that was discussed particularly yesterday afternoon in the yesterday afternoon session, um, that we can then view that this sort of experiment is potentially evidencing, for example, the metric perturbation caused by such a mass to be placed in a, a quantum superposition itself, um, and that we don't really need to go beyond general relativity and quantum field theory to conclude that this is providing at least evidence for, not necessarily uh, in con uh, conclusive proof, but at least evidence for uh, the existence of something like a graviton, as this would, without going beyond yeah, quantum field theory, this is a a suitable candidate for providing the, the quantum channel, which is, is enabling the uh, masses to become entangled. Um, okay, so going back to the, the experiment, we can write down so what are the key requirements we need. Um, so what we, what we concluded was that we really need sort of something like two massive particles. So massive in that they provide a sufficient gravitational entanglement. They could have gravitational source for one another. Um, and they should be, in, in, in the end, they need to be placed in spatial superpositions to enable that entanglement then to form. Um, we need to make sure that the mass in interact with one another only through gravity. So this is really that uh, the uh, minimum 
this it basically implies that there's a minimum distance between them. So we would need to do things like ensure that the, the masses are charge neutralized and whatnot so that they're not interacting through electrostatic interactions, but also means that we need to make sure things like the Casimir interaction is, is negligible. And so we are indeed probing the gravitational interaction between the two masses. Uh, finally, we'll obviously need um, the spatial splitting to be held for long enough for entanglement to develop. Uh, that's so that we produce a, a witnessable effect, really. Um, so what we then did was consider a few different ways we could uh, feasibly modify such a setup to try and um, uh, reduce the, the required uh, experimental parameters. So we considered different uh, geometries as well as, well, there's no real specific requirements for the using something like qubits. We could potentially go to higher dimensional systems. Uh, we also looked at things like different entanglement witnesses, uh, uh, as well as, um, as I previously mentioned, being Casimir interaction, providing the um, sort of minimum distance between the masses, what happens if we try and screen that? Um, and then finally, we also looked at decoherence in a very gen general uh, sense and looked at how that uh, interacts with these other different uh, changes we could try and make to the, to the setup. Um, so, to look at some of the more extremal versions of the geometries um, considered. So the original proposal had the, what we called here the linear setup where the two masses are placed in superposition sort of side by side. The thinking was to make sure that the uh, distances involved between the inner states and the outer states is, is as different as possible. We also we said, well, what happens if we, we tried something else? So for example, what we call here the parallel setup where the distances involved are actually all minimized rather than being made as different as possible. Uh, we can characterize the entanglement that forms in here uh, uh, by the von Neumann entropy. And what we found was that the parallel setup actually produces a sizable, uh, considerably more entanglement. Um, I'll just note that uh, in these uh, plots, the parameters used were generally uh, correspond to those proposed in the original QGEM uh, proposal, although it, the exact values aren't so much of, of interest so much as um, just the, the general scaling behavior. Um, so then we could also say, well, what happens if we use higher dimensional states rather than just uh, qubits? So as shown here for use of qtrits, so three-dimensional qdits. Um, and again, we can consider the entanglement entropy and how, how it develops with time to try and get an idea of what the optimal setup is. Um, again, we can consider different geometries. And what we found is that once again, the parallel setup seems to uh, generate entanglement at a much faster rate, um, but also that the going to higher dimensional systems is not hugely helpful, or at least apparently not hugely helpful. So we see that the higher the dimensional system, the slower the rate of entanglement generated. So a qubit will uh, seems to develop entanglement at a much, much faster rate. Um, this is, however, in a bit of an idealized case. So then we thought, well, what happens if in the presence of decoherence? Um, so in that case, uh, we present here the, rather than just the uh, entanglement entropy, we considered you know, a reasonable experiment. We'll obviously have to be trying to detect this entanglement and it's, that's done by using entanglement witnesses. Um, so in this case, the entanglement witness is set up by uh, evidencing entanglement when its value is less than one. Um, and when the value of the expectation value entanglement witness is zero or greater than one, it really doesn't tell you anything about whether or not the particles are indeed entangled. So what we found was that again, for low decoherence rates, qubits perform so much better than anything else. However, as you increase the decoherence rate, uh, suddenly the higher dimensional systems start uh, real, reeling a, a more negative entanglement witness expectation value. And importantly, there comes a certain point where sticking to qubits would result in the entanglement witness expectation value being positive. And so that means that you just could not possibly uh, witness any sort of entanglement, even if it is there or not. And in that case, it would be necessary to go to higher dimensional systems to still sort of retrieve or, or see the entanglement that is there. Um, so this is the, basically the same sort of thing, this time showing the uh, entanglement witness val expectation value scaling with time at two different uh, uh, decoherence rates. And we see that um, 
sort of for the uh, lower, lower, for a sufficiently low uh, decoherence rate, you might as well probably stick to the qubits, but perhaps in a more realistic ses setting when the decoherence rate might be sort of not incredibly low, um, it, it may be entirely necessary to go to uh, a higher dimensional system. So the, the takeaway from this though really is that once we are at the stage when we're ready to actually do the experiment, we'll really need to sit back and go, okay, what's the entanglement rate and what's the decoherence rate that we're expecting and then think about and we might need to modify the setup such that it uses a high dimensional system. Um, so the uh, one of the other things we considered, again, as I mentioned earlier, was uh, how, what can we do about this uh, Casimir interaction, basically placing a, a minimum uh, interaction distance between the two masses. So uh, that the Casimir interaction to ensure that it's uh, much smaller than the gravitational interaction between the, the masses, uh, it basically implied that the distance between the two masses has to be something like 200 micrometers. Um, and then that obviously reduces the gravitational interaction strength itself. And so uh, basically makes the whole thing much harder to see. Um, but what we found is that by simply using a, a conductive uh, screening plate, we might hope to um, just screen the Casimir interaction. There is obviously still a Casimir interaction between the, the masses and the plate itself. And so that can introduce something like decoherence. And um, well, as mentioned in the previous talk, that can sort of lead to effective interaction between them. So we, we still have a minimum distance between the two masses, basically minimum distance between the masses and the screening plate. Um, however, what we found is that the this minimum distance between the masses is effectively reduced by something like an order of magnitude. So we could then say, well, what happens when we put this all together? And what we found was that um, the original proposal uh, really required something like uh, superposition sizes on the order of uh, 250 micrometers, as well as uh, long interaction total experiment times so of something like three and a half seconds and using quite large masses, 10 to minus 14 kilograms. However, when we sort of take all these slightly different modifications to the original setup together uh, and work out what the, the parameters uh, that are going to be necessary to witness entanglement, um, they suggest that we can sort of get dramatic improvement. So we can get the, the superposition size is decreased by more than an order of magnitude. The time, total uh, experiment runtime is reduced. Um, and a, quite in, interestingly, the masses that you need to use are reduced by two orders of magnitude. Um, so this suggests like a, a quite a sizable improvement on the, the parameter space that are, is required to, to get some, some sort of witnessable entanglement. Um, okay. so. We can then look at um, we then looked at uh, the stone gale like interferometer that was sort of proposed and and sort of looked at what other changes we might need to make with that. So, in the original uh, experiment, we it was sort of relying on uh, the sort of wisdom based on the earlier the original stone gale like experiment. So, we can just have a, a spin dependent uh, force due to the uh, NV centers coupling with a. a the uh, ex external magnetic field, and you end up with a force which is spin dependent and will and as well change direction. And it's also uh, scaled with the magnetic field gradient. And so then if you wanted to create a, a large magnetic field, all you need to do is uh, increase the time so that the spatial splitting size should scale to something like the T squared. Um, and that the, uh, this uh, splitting size will scale with the magnetic field gradient, so linearly with the magnetic field gradient, and so that was that was the sort of initial thought. But then it was it was highlighted that actually, given we're going to such uh, large masses, we can we also have to consider the fact that the the spheres are, have a, a diamagnetic uh, interaction with the external magnetic field, and so that itself can uh, uh, change the the motion quite dramatically. So we said, okay, well, what, what, what will we need? We, we still want the constant magnetic field gradient. And so a linear magnetic field. Um, but Maxwell's equation tells us that that will really give us a, a gradient in two different directions. So both the desired splitting direction as well as uh, in a, a perpendicular direction. So in here written as the y direction. Um, but we really only want the one direction. And so what we can do is, is ensure that the coupling in a single direction is, is pref 
uh, preferred and, and basically the internal spin state is held frozen in the original thing by using a, a bias field. And so this is what was originally done in the sort of the Stone Gaelic experiments. Um, but then there's a still another issue is that we don't want the particle to enter sort of the zero field region of the magnetic field. So this, if that happens, then we could expect something like a potential Majorana spin flips to occur and the, the coherence of the, the spins might potentially be lost. And so we then said, okay, well, that probably, that possibly puts a region in the magnetic field that we, sh we really need to avoid in some way or do something else to, to get around this issue. So if we go back to the, if we consider then the, the full Hamiltonian for the, the mass, um, considering both the diamagnetic and the uh, sort of the stern gaelic uh, like terms, um, and we ask what, what the sort of potential that this is generating, uh, we see that it's, it's nothing more than the old uh, uh, harmonic oscillator like potential. And so we can see that what we end up with is placing a mass in this with an internal spin state and it with a spin superposition, it put places in a spin dependent uh, harmonic well. And so they'll oscillate it at the same frequency, but through uh, wells that are, have slightly different uh, centers. Um, so when we thought, well, how can we uh, still use this? Uh, we could expect that we could either close the interferometer before it reaches the zero field region, or alternately, uh, what we consider doing was um, if we could instead map to a, a constant magnetic field that's uh, small but non-zero through that zero field region. Um, and so that's uh, what we thought was a better option because closing it before we get to the zero field region is, is extremely limiting in the sort of uh, time you have before it um, before you need to close the interferometer. Uh, so doing that reduce, uh, results in very sort of unusual trajectories whereby you end up with a very asymmetric interferometer um, and you end up with a, a result of um, that the uh, that the uh, total interferometry, the superposition size actually scales linearly with time, unlike uh, quadratically with time, as was originally expected. Um, we also found this also suggests that as the oscillation frequency is linear in the magnetic field gradient, you end up with the total uh, experimental runtime, or that so that you end up with the superposition size scaling inversely with the magnetic field gradient which was uh, sort of somewhat unexpected in a way. Um, so if we ask what then does this predict of the sort of superposition size we can realistically expect, um, it, it's uh, severely reduced based on compared to the original experimental proposal, but it's close to what we need. So for example, what uh, we found is that we needed something like a 10 to the minus 16 kilogram mass uh, with a total interferometry time of one second, we've required something like a 20 micrometer superposition size. Um, this ends up with something closer to the two micrometer superposition size, but it's still not uh, uh, dramatically off. So there's still sort of work to be done to improve this, but yeah, that's where it is at the moment. Um, I'll right also there, four minutes. Okay, sure. I'll also uh, just say that this obviously still requires um, sort of extreme precision and extreme certainty in a lot of the parameters. So to achieve that sort of superposition size, we can, with a, a fairly crude noise analysis, say that we require, you know, 10 millikelvin temperatures and, and very low pressures. Also, it would require very stable currents and timing certainty. So with um, the current fluctuations being less than 10 to the minus 11 Teslas and uh, timing certainties on the order of uh, a nanosecond, uh, and also extreme, quite high isotopic purities of the, the the diamond nanosphere is required, but that's sort of just sets the sets the level of difficulty for such an experiment. So we'll also obviously try and work towards improving these, but I mean, it's it's the reason it hasn't been done yet, I guess, to a certain extent. <laughs> um, so with the last few minutes, I'll just briefly touch on uh, some of the work we've been doing with looking at uh, external applications for such a device. So particularly. Um, given such a device is expected to be a, a fantastic, uh, fantastically sensitive to the gravitational field, well, we can say what other gravitational sources could we use to detect this? So we considered uh, here just a fairly pictographic uh, form of uh, uh, an interferometer 
a massive particle interferometer um, where you could either have just a standard symmetric form or alternatively you could have a, an asymmetric form of the interferometer. If we ask what sort of uh, difference, what sort of signal are we going to view at the end here, that'll be um, that you can calculate that by just looking at the action over the, uh, the trajectories taken where you force the trajectories based on the, the interferometer itself, and then you, you can integrate the action over the, um, as defined by the, the metric, space-time metric uh, that it's moving through. So what we can see then is that the uh, output signal will be some function of uh, all the, the sort of the three uh, key components of the, or we can separate out the, uh, the signal as a function of the three different components of the space-time metric. So, um, and potentially address each individually one. So we can write out, uh, writing this out uh, for the asymmetric interferometer, we found that it's actually couples uh, interestingly directly to the curvature term. So for an asymmetric interferometer, we can expect signal sources that look uh, something like this. So we can get uh, both first order sort of the H00 terms, which would be something like the Newtonian phase, as well as directly coupling to the curvature. Um, obviously with a very small signal, but it's, it's interestingly there nonetheless. Um, we also found that it's, it's potentially uh, entirely capable of uh, picking up things like uh, space uh, frame dragging like effects with coupling to the H zero J like terms of the uh, space time metric and its, its uh, derivatives. Um, and in the interest of time, uh, we also found that it all uh, is entirely capable of uh, coupling to the H, uh, the, the gravitational wave term. So this, the H, XX, HYY type terms of the, the space time metric. Um, obviously, uh, if we hope to detect gravitational waves with such a device, it would need to be, you know, quite staggering. I think, uh, yeah, they quite described it as crazy. Um, sized detectors with superposition sizes on the order of a meter for a 10 to the minus 17 kilogram mass. However, I th we think it thought it was worth highlighting that such a device is, is still, you know, entirely capable of detecting gravitational, if we could make it such a device, it would be entirely capable of detecting things like gravitational waves while being uh, you know, dramatically smaller than something like LIGO, uh, which is an advantage at least. Um, so uh, yeah. I think that's that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, for a very interesting talk. Uh, I see Andrew has a question, but before that, I'll make one quick comment about the qubits. So you said uh, it's preferable to use uh, qubits, and actually, it's interesting because it it sort of comes naturally from the experiment. If you want to increase the gradients, the first thing. I at least thought of is to use more uh, more spins in the envy, but then let's say in a two spin in your envy center, um, you don't get you don't just push them because you have all of the upper projections. So you have one the up up the up down goes to the middle and then the down down goes to the left. So these trajectories for qubits which you showed sort of comes naturally and is desirable experimentally. So it's yeah, interesting. So that was sort of part of the the original way we came up with it because we thought oh well you know it's, it's a fairly straightforward okay. way to yeah just think of it uh, I'll, I'll just note though that we didn't we sort of selected that we assumed that if you were going to use qubits you'd use sort of the highest dimensional just the end states and so we're not sort of get, cheating to gain an advantage by saying using qubits means a larger effective total superposition size we assumed the total superposition size was fixed and you just ignore the inner states if if that's what you had available to you too okay but, yeah Makes sense. thank you so andrew i see you have a question yeah, very, very nice talk. Uh, I, I just had a I had a few questions, but really a quick one for now, I guess. So the uh, new trajectory that you described with the magnetic response, how is that compatible or is it compatible with your Casimir screen idea or, or do those things, uh, how do those fit together, I guess? So, well, strictly speaking, they were somewhat independent projects, but if we're going to stick to the, um, the, the um, parallel uh, setups, you could see that you could have both of them moving sort of, they will move a long way to the left or the right, say, with the screen being between the two sets of masses. So I think it should be entirely uh, possible to do both. 
if, if, if that makes sense. So there, you could see that there was a large amount of motion separate to the, the superposition size. The center of mass translation was quite large, but you could still have that they would be, that, that was in the same direction as the superposition size itself. And so, you know, in this case, you'd have mass A moving all the way over here and then back here um, and mass B doing the same, but you'd have the screen being between them in this way. I see. So, Okay. Any other questions? I see not. Okay. Ah, uh, Martin, sorry, you have. Yeah, perhaps if I could just uh, quickly okay. ask. So, I mean, of course, I mean, we looked at the, we had looked at the effect of the um, diamagnetic force and then yes, the yes, yeah. this, this, that that was uh, not such a nice thing actually. Um, but then you the, pointed the out that um, you, made, um, you mentioned um, that you don't want to go through a field zero. And for certain reasons, I agree with that. But I mean, does this have really a bad effect on the NV center? Because these Majorano transitions that you're speaking about they should not uh, take place there, even in zero field. I mean, I can I can use an NV center perfectly fine in zero field, so I'm a bit confused. Okay, uh, so well, we had discussions which sort of suggested that might be a concern. If it if it's not, perhaps it's not. Mm -hmm. So is is about, probably about as much of a response as I can I can give yeah, at the moment. Yeah, good, good. Right. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Brian, could you unshare your screen and we'll go to the next Sorry. talk? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the next talk is by uh, Gavin Morley from Warwick University. He's going to talk about levitating nanodiamond experiments towards a test of quantum gravity. Thanks very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be uh, giving a talk in this uh, marvelous conference. Thanks very much to the organizers. And I'd like to tell you a bit um, about our plans for the same kind of experiment that we've been hearing about today from Martin and, uh, and Ryan and from other people earlier on in this, um, in this lovely meeting. You know, this, this, this topic is the, is, um, you know, that I'm talking about is, is this central uh, topic that a lot of people in this conference are talking about, about trying to entangle two masses using gravity. Let me start by um, thanking all the people that have been involved with this. It's been really excellent working with all these, um, these great people. This, of course, is what my group looks like now in, uh, um, in pandemic times. So, um, in a stern gerlach experiment, as we've heard, then you can have a superposition of an atom being, in the on, on, being on the left and being on the right. Of course, um, you could think of wanting to do the same thing with a cat, but a cat is incredibly heavy. And so um, where we're wanting to work, as you've been hearing in this meeting, is in between. We'd like to have a, a diamond that's about um, 250, nanometers across and we'd like to have a, a superposition distance that's that's this distance here we'd like that to be um, eventually we'd like that to get up to this 20 micron um, length scale that, that Ryan talked about in order to test quantum gravity so here's the question that, that we're all talking about can we test the gravitational effect of a mass in a spatial superposition and I'm going to try and get right into the details in this talk. So I gave a talk um, last week in a quantum gravity conference organized um, uh, online at, at uh, BIRS, the Banff International Research State Station. And that's, that, that talk was a very sort of um, general overview um, talk, but we've had so much great introduction to this work already. I'm gonna try and get right into the, um, into the details here. So these, um, are some papers over the years where we've been proposing uh, how to do this experiment that, that we're, we're interested in. There's this stern gerlach experiment. We want to have a levitated nanodiamond at the top and it 
you put it into a spin superposition and then an inhomogeneous, well, well so we have an, an NV center, we have an electron spin inside the, um, inside the nanodiamond and um, um, that NV center has, has an electron spin. And um, um, I'll just look for the, uh, the, the pointer. So, so then the, the, this NV center electron spin, we put it into a spin superposition and then in an inhomogeneous magnetic field, then there would be this superposition of, of two paths. And then we have to recombine it for this interference at the end. And so we described this um, here in, in, in 2013. Um, and then these other papers uh, improve on, on, on these proposals. And um, we have some um, um, latest uh, description here that I, I want, to, uh, want to get onto today. So let me first say something about this nitrogen vacancy center in diamond. And if you get a diamond, um, um, this, this is a one millimeter diamond in my lab and it's full of these nitrogen vacancy centers, which gives it this, this uh, lovely color. And, um, and this, this red color, we shine in green light and this, this red light, this red fluorescence comes off. This is the structure of the NV center in diamond. So there's a nitrogen atom where a carbon would have been. And then there's a, a missing carbon here. This is this marvelous uh, defect. When we send in light, then we can polarize the electron spin. And we can also use this red fluorescence to detect the state of that spin. And so that's necessary for a single, we do that for a single spin. Um, here's the sort of equipment that we use in my lab to, to do that. and um, here's an example where we're looking at these two NV center defects in bulk diamonds. So this is not levitating. I'll get on to levitation later, but this is um, um, just uh, in an experiment like this, uh, which is quite common in, in other labs without, without any levitation. But the other marvelous thing about these defects is that they have very long spin coherence times. And so we're going to need, we're going to need that, we're going to need to avoid decoherence in this whole experiment. And so here I'm trying to, I, I was gonna say, I was gonna call this a roadmap towards testing quantum gravity. I think that roadmap is too, um, is too generous. So this is just part of a, um, a, a journey that, that we're all on trying to, uh, trying to build this experiment and we'll learn stuff along the way. This is this quantum gravity experiment that, uh, that, that we're focusing on um, um, at the end. So where are we at the moment worldwide, you know, in all different labs? So levitating nanodiamonds is, um, is routine with optical trapping, and with iron trapping and with uh, magnetic trapping. Um, and then, so I'm gonna talk about this for a bit and then get on to this, um, this you know, how I, how I see the route towards actually getting to the quantum gravity experiment. Um, and so um, the optical trapping was, was the most advanced for a long time. So uh, Nick Panavakis and, and Tong Kang Lee were, were doing awesome stuff with optical uh, and still are doing awesome stuff with optical levitation, optical tweezers using nanodiamonds. Um, and then we were, building some of the same stuff in my lab. So this, is, um, this was our optical tweezer experiment with, with nanodiamonds. We've taken it apart now, but I'll, I'll get to that later. So this is a photo of the, um, the trapping chamber. And here, is this green dot is the levitate, this optically levitated nanodiamond. This is the microscope objective. And this is nice as a design because this microscope objective is great for collecting the light that's coming off the fluorescence light that's coming off this diamond, and you need uh, you need to be able to collect that light very well. So the optical trapping um, is is attractive in that way. It has a big problem that I'll come to in a minute. But this optical trapping allowed, um, like in in Nick Nick lab, then this uh, this work. Let, let them study a single NV center in an optically levitated nanodiamond and control the spin state. Um, and they, they have done co coherent, you know, control of the spin state as well. And Tong Kang Lee is, is talking later in this meeting um, as well. So this was all um, looking great, but this is um, um, not at, at, at high vacuum. This is in, in air. And of course, for the quantum 
um, gravity type experiments, we need to have no air, we need to have no gas in there because we mustn't, because a single gas atom is colliding with our diamond is gonna destroy the superposition for the, the real serious experiments that we want to do. Um, and so then, you know, this atmospheric uh, type pressure or, or, you know, few millibar type pressure is, is that, that was achieved in these papers is, is not low enough pressure. And so then in my lab, uh, working with Peter Barker, we, we were looking at optical trapping of nanodiamonds and we found that the problem is that they're, they're heating up too much and they're being destroyed, they're getting graphitized because the, you know, when the temperatures get up to this sort of temperature of the diamond, then the diamonds get graphitized and, and they get destroyed. And that's no good. And this isn't a problem at, at higher pressures, because the, the air can take away the heat. But as we get the pressure down, then there's no air to dissipate the heat. This led us to uh, what we thought at the time was, was perhaps a solution to this problem. And that came from this insight that the nanodiamonds that everybody's using um, are the commercial nanodiamonds that are made from diamond material that looks like this. You wouldn't want to give this as an engagement ring. This is quite a nasty yellow color because it's got 150 parts per million of, of nitrogen in it. And so what we wanted was to use a thousand times purer diamond. And so indeed we bought this stuff with um, 100 parts per billion of, of nitrogen. It's nice and clear. And then Ollie Williams group turned this into nano diamonds for us. And then you know that, that really helped a great deal. So that meant that in the optical trap, then um, the center of mass motion, the center of mass temperature, the, that's the, like the amplitude of, of the motion, um, it wasn't heating up. And also the internal temperature um, wasn't heating up. It was a, a room temperature. And this was at four millibar. Um, so this was progress um, in a way at the time, because you know this was looking like, uh, and the reason of course is that, you know, this clear, these clear nanodiamonds are not absorbing so much of the trapping light. But we want to do this experiment really with the internal temperature of the nanodiamond at cryogenic temperatures. And so optical trapping is just not going to, uh, to, to be compatible with that according to our simulations. So you're going to need a magnetic trap, a diamagnetic trap instead. Um, and I'll come back to the diamagnetic trap in a sec. But first, another important benefit of these more pure nanodiamonds um, is that they have better spin coherence times, which I'll just show you now. Um, so this is images of, of our nanodiamonds, scanning electron microscope images. This is one of our, our nanodiamonds, this is our favorite one. And here you can see that we've cleverly designed the experiment so that we can collect fluorescence light from known nanodiamonds and we can look at them um, in the um, scanning electron microscopy and know that this light is coming from this diamond. And so that led us, that, that let um, us measure the spin coherence time of, of a known sized nanodiamond. This is like the sort of size we want to use in our superposition experiment. And the spin echo coherence time um, was 177 microseconds. With dynamic decoupling, we can get to 460 microseconds. Now, if, if if you're not familiar with um, spin echo, let me quickly show you this, this animation. Um, so this creates a superposition here. The fanning out is, is look, something that looks like decoherence. And then this pi pulse refocuses that to give you the echo, get, get you back where you want. This is a ubiquitous and very useful tool in, in magnetic resonance. And um, um, we want to, you know, we need to incorporate this into our experiment with, with the superposition of the, of the position, but also we need many of these pi pulses. So we need dynamic decoupling. So this longer spin coherence time comes from the dynamic decoupling. And so we need that spin dynamic decoupling um, in, in our superposition experiment. And this is um, a paper which shows how much dynamic decoupling you need uh, this is not in nanodiamonds, certainly not levitated. And it's showing that with, with 10,000 or so of these pi pulses, if you cryogenically cool, then you can reach a, a spin coherence time of about half a, sec half, half a second, which is, which is 
really excellent. If you don't have the, the dynamic decoupling, if you're only sending in, you know, a single pi pulse, then you're stuck at, at milliseconds, you know, one or two milliseconds, which is, which is not going to be practical for the, the, the grand experiments that we're talking about. Okay, now back to this magnetic trap I mentioned. So the diamond is going to have to be at an internal temperature, you know, that, that's 5K or, or 1K, 1 Kelvin or, or less, maybe 0.1 Kelvin. And the optical trapping just isn't, isn't, isn't going to work with that because the optical trapping light is going to heat up the internal temperature of the diamond. So we, we want to use, so, so, so in my lab now, we're switching over from this optical trap to, this, to, a, to a diamagnetic trap. And so this has been done in, in two labs um, already, diamagnetic trapping with diamond, and we're copying this design. We're, we're modifying it a bit so that we can get the light out a bit better. But so this is, um, this is part of our plan. And of course, the wonderful thing about a magnetic trap is that it gives you the inhomogeneous magnetic field that you want for the stern Gerlach anyway. So iron trapping, you know, would be a contender as well, but you would still have to get in this inhomogeneous magnetic field. And so, um, yeah, I think a diamagnetic trap is better. I think it's going to be less, less noisy as well, but that, we'll have to see, see if that's the case. Okay, so that's sort of what, what, what's been going on so far. And now let's, let's look ahead. So this is this um, um, next step that I see. So this is something that we're working on um, building right now in the lab. And it is putting, we want to put the diamagnetically levitated nanodiamond into a spin superposition. And then the, the inhomogeneous magnetic field will give us a, a superposition of the diamond being in two places at once. Now, it's not, it's not gonna look like this because the spatial superposition distance is gonna be very, very, very tiny. It might be, um, I expect it'll be, um, 10 femtometers, roughly 100 femtometers, compared to a diamond of, of 250 nanometers across. So that's that's minuscule, but that would be the first spatial superposition of, of a nanoparticle. So that would be exciting. And it wouldn't test any new physics, but it would be um, an important step on the way. And the decoherence requirements here are very generous, you know, in terms of the, um, you know, all, they've all been met already you know the diamond doesn't have to be cold internally and its internal temperature doesn't have to be cold we don't need um, uh, gas pressure that, that hasn't already been demonstrated and you know for levitated now diamonds and so i think this is all sort of quite reasonable now the next step is is a big leap so going from one to two is basically um big leap in the dark in various ways, I think. And, and, and so this step one was, was what we described in, in 2013, theoretically. Step two then combines all the insights from these three papers. I think you have to do them all at the same time. So you have to go to free flight. So that was described in this 2016 paper. Um, and free flight means that you're no longer trapped. And then that allows the superposition distance to get bigger because otherwise the trapping is keeping it small. Um, and then we need magnetic teeth. So I'm gonna describe them in a minute so that they're in this new paper. Um, I'll, I'll describe what, what, what the magnetic teeth means. Um, we need a cryostat, everything has to be cold. Um, and we need some dynamic decoupling. Some, this, is, this is emotional dynamic de decoupling. So two lobe is, is the, I'll, I'll show you a picture. Two lobe is the smallest type of motion or dynamic decoupling that, that, that you can do. And so Martin Plenio um, nicely introduced um, in his talk, the motion of dynamic decoupling, and that was something that he introduced here in this paper. And this paper, let me mention quickly, is a great paper. This paper also um, was where Martin pointed out that um, you've got this, um, this inhomogeneous magnetic field that you have to have, and that that limits the spatial superposition distance um, because you get um, uh, effectively you get you get some magnetic trapping diamagnetic trapping due to that and that means that you know you don't you don't want to make this uh, the inhomogeneous magnetic field as, as strong as possible you uh, you know your, your superposition distance doesn't keep increasing if, if you try that and so um, yeah lots of important and and brilliant uh, lots of decoherence analysis in the archive version of this paper as well um, so we're going to need these two elements, and yeah, and and in this 
third paper, then we introduced these magnetic teeth, which um, um, we're going to need. So here's, here's um, a schematic picture of, of the magnetic teeth in this, in this um, paper from Ben Wood et al. Just gone on the archive just recently. So let me talk through um, this stuff, because this is sort of the main um, um, stuff I'd like to get onto. Um, like I said, this is just the emotional dynamic decoupling though first from, uh, from Martin's paper, um, as, as you saw in his talk. And so um, this is um, a necessary thing that we're gonna need. Unfortunately, so, so the, the emotional dynamic decoupling gives you a pi pulse here and here and here, and that's great for the spin, except unfortunately, they're too slow. They're, they're, they're not coming in quickly enough. So this natural period of the trap is going to be about, um, it's going to take about 100 milliseconds, this period. And, you know, maybe you could get it to 10 milliseconds. But if we're sending in these pi pulses on that time scale, then we're going to completely lose our NV um, spin coherence after one or two milliseconds. So that's, so, so, so this is not enough dynamic decoupling. And so this is why, this is not enough dynamic decoupling for the spin. And so this is why we need um, these teeth, these magnetic teeth that I mentioned. And so here are these teeth. And so putting it all together here in this experiment, what we're talking about is initially trapping the nano diamond here, dropping it here through a meter and a bit. The reason for this drop here is that the nano diamond picks up speed. And so it needs to be um, going fast enough when it meets these teeth that it can go past them um, in a short enough time so that the dynamic so the spin dynamic decoupling works so that we can keep the uh, you know we need to get up to these spin coherence times of the electron spin of, of half a second or so or at least you know 200 milliseconds um, and so so that, that that's the uh, the reason we need these these teeth let's zoom in now on these teeth so they're not to scale here this makes it look like they're this makes it look like the teeth are huge because of this one meter um, length, but actually these teeth are tiny. So these teeth, as you can see here, are um, 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 200 microns across. And the clever idea from Ben, so Ben did this finite element modeling, this finite element simulation. And the clever idea from Ben here was that the teeth should be offset like this. And um, let me show you um, now why. So this is from the modeling. So the blue is um, the magnetic field gradient and it's oscillating because the teeth are offset. That means that um, the diamond, when it comes out into a spatial superposition, then we can, um, we're gonna flip the spin every time the direction of, of the magnetic field gradient changes. And so that's going to let us send in lots more pi pulses so that we can preserve the spin coherence. And, um, um, and, and, and in spite of sending in all these extra pi pulses, we're still gonna keep on building up a bigger superposition distance because we're changing this um, dB by dx, this, this blue line um, keeps changing. Um, okay, so having thought about all that, we then still need these, this is, two lobes of the motional dynamic decoupling that Martin um, uh, Plenio was talking about um, in, in, the, in his um, PRL from 2020. Um, and what this does, like he was saying, is it gets rid of some of your sensitivity to the decoherence. And so this is a partial list of the decoherence things that we have worried about. And in particular, tilt here, is um, um, would it would be a, a complete killer. It would be completely lethal without some motion dynamic, dynamic decoupling. So you would need like ten pico radian control of the tilt if you weren't doing any of this motion dynamic decoupling. But with just these two lobes, then we massively get rid of that, so that we only need um, tilt control of, you know, more like um, micro radians or, or tens of micro radians, which is, you know, easily, easily demonstrated already in the lab. So that's great. What else? So 
each lobe, like I said, is about 100 milliseconds. So this is the coherent time. And so we need about 200 milliseconds of, of spin coherence. I think that's feasible with, um, with the sort of nano diamonds that we've got with, with a lot of um, pulses of dy dynamic decoupling. Um, so Martin's, yeah, it, three minutes. Great, yeah. So Martin's archive paper also points out, well, well so th this PRL, um, that the archive version of that points out that you have about a thousand extra electron spins on the surface of the nano diamond, and that would be lethal. So we would need, and, and people have worked on reducing that. I mean, you know, so a thousand is, is you know, probably there are a lot more than a thousand, but at least a thousand. So there's going to be need to be some um, materials development to better passivate the surface of the nano diamond. And people have tried, so it's not that, that isn't uncharted territory. But so we would need some progress there. The pressure would need to be um, 10 to the minus 13 millibar, based on this theory paper from uh, Oriel. Um, based on yeah the same sort of theory paper from Oriel, then we need about five Kelvin internal temperature for the diamond. By the way, this is all to get a 250 nanometer diamond into a spatial superposition with 250 nanometer. Um, spatial superposition distance. Um, rotation of the diamond, we have to worry about the Casimir. Electric charges are pretty lethal, so everything has to be at, at cryogenic temperatures, and we need to make sure that none of the electrons on, this, um, on the surface of this magnet move, none of them are allowed to move. Um, so that might be um, something that, that's challenging. Timing errors are kind of easy by comparison. Um, okay, so this is this is um, step two. So, so the jump from step one to step two is quite big and difficult. Step three, then, um, we need to get up to 20 micro. So, so this is only um, 250 nanometers. To get up to 20 microns, we need to do more dynamic decoupling, but that won't be enough on its own because the electron spin coherence is not going to get beyond half a second or so. So we're going to need to use clever tricks using um, the nuclear spin. We're going to have to move the quantum information from the electron spin into the nuclear spin so that the diamond continues to move um, apart while we store the, the, the coherence of the spin in the nuclear spin. Once we, you know, if we get to step three, then doing step four in principle is just a case of, of, of you know, um, having two diamonds and putting them together, which is still very hard. But um, um, yeah, uh, we, we knew that this is an incredibly hard experiment. This is a very long-term um, idea. So I think my time is about up. So um, here's some conclusions. This is my last slide. So um, I described how, you know, in some detail, we'd like to uh, drop these levitated nanodiamonds and test quantum gravity. And experimentally, I showed you that these more pure nanodiamonds that we've made have, you know, this is this is the longest um, spin coherence for, for comparable nanodiamonds, um, you know, ever. And so that's that's progress, and, and that's going to be a necessary component, I think. Okay, so thanks very much for listening. That's um, that's the end of this talk. Thank you, Gavin. That's a really interesting talk. And maybe I'll ask one quick question. Uh, so you said that pure nano diamonds don't heat, heat up as much. And so what's the reason? Basically it's absorption due to the nitrogen. I mean, can you say? Yeah, yeah that's it. So um, yellow diamonds absorb the trapping light and the colorless diamonds don't absorb it so much. So, so if you have a really pure diamond, you'd expect almost zero heating? No, I mean, so, you know, we, we've done some modeling and the most pure nano diamond that's conceived, you know, that, that, that is, is, is possible, you would still have a, you'd still have heating in an optical trap, you know, uh, maybe you might be able to get to 200 Kelvin or, or, or 100 Kelvin, but you wouldn't, wouldn't get cold enough. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see Christian Vogt has a, has a question. Yes, hi. Um, I was wondering if, because um, from the from the silica particles, the optical trapping, people want to get these particles as round as possible, as spherical as it is somehow possible. Your nano diamonds 
aren't roundly shaped at all. And do I understand this is right, that this is not a problem for you because you're not using the outer shape for trapping it? Yeah, so the shape of the diamond um, is relevant. So it doesn't need, they don't need to be spherical. Um, um, but we have to worry about rotation of the diamond, whether it's whether it was spherical or not, then we have to worry about rotation. So the non-spherical shape helps with that because I didn't say this, but in the paper with Martin Penio and me, we suggested that this is the nano diamond. We're going to need electrodes, which initially, before we drop it, we're going to need electrodes that um, um, help to align it because otherwise it's, it's going to be, um, you know, having too much rotational motion, migrational rotational motion. And so the fact it's non-spherical will let us use a dielectric force from an electrode to, to help um, reduce the rotations, actually. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Andrew, you had a question? Uh, yeah, I had a related question, really nice talk. Uh, so regarding controlling the orientation while you're in the free fall stage, uh, so is there, a, what would be the, the plan for that, I guess would be uh, one question. And then um, a second uh, question I had was about the optical trapping. Have you considered, uh, some people have done solid state internal cooling of particles. Do you think it might be possible to use that to push to even colder temperatures in an optical trap? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, um, thanks for those good questions. So yeah, the rotation is is important. So in the paper with Martin Plenio, then we looked at that. That's the best place where we've looked at that, where, you know, Martin and, and Julian have, have looked at that. In our paper now with, with Ben Wood, then we think that we need about four degrees control of the rotation, which doesn't sound too bad. Obviously, as you say, though, Andy, um, you know, it's one thing controlling it in the trap, but it has to stay controlled as we drop it. And yeah, so we have some um, some hope there. So this, the reason we have, a, one of the reasons we have this homogeneous magnetic field here is that there's this effect that UA Mar um, talked about where a homogeneous magnetic field can help to hold um, the nanodiamond aligned rotationally thanks to the NV center. There's a PRA paper where she's the first author, YUE um, is her first name and MA is her, her surname. And so, so that that would help. Um, yeah, I mean, in principle, if, you know, uh, yeah, so, so it's, it's, yeah, uh, the orientation in the drop is, is going to be important and we haven't, we haven't, you know, that, that's another, definitely another thing to worry about. And then you said, um, what about, you know, having something like, so, Peter Barker and Anis Rahman demonstrated that you can levitate these particles of um, uh, YLF and they can have defects in them where you can do solid state optical cooling. I think that's um, a great, um, uh, you know, a great experiment, but, um, you know, they haven't managed to get those, those particles down to, to five Kelvin by any, by a long shot. Um, and, you know, having the diamond there wouldn't, wouldn't help um, and you know we might need to get to 5k or, or 1k or, or you know late for the gravity experiment we might need 0.1 kelvin so yeah it's, it's a good line of research but i think you know when they send in the the light for the optical cooling then that that can have a heating effect as well and so it doesn't it's not a route to, to zero temperature of course and um so yeah i just plan to have the the diamond so brian Durso has demonstrated that you can load nano diamonds into a magnetic trap um, in vacuum and so then i just plan to um, have have the diamond cooled by being in contact with a cold surface and then shake the diamonds off into the trap um yeah so that's um that, that's what i think about internal cooling i guess thanks okay I see no other questions and we're already uh, starting towards discussion, but maybe I'll ask one more question.